1952, I went to Canada, I remember. I couldn't get a job here. Did a lot of work there. Met a strange fellow called Sidney Newman. And I came to England in 1960 and had given it up entirely. I was uh, uh, working in an office to support my family. And I worked on a thing about Winston Churchill called The Valiant Years. I had Johnny Schlesinger as my director. And we produced this rather fabulous series. Richard Burton narrated it. Richard Rogers wrote the music. And they said, would you like to do this show on television? I said, what, what, what as? Well, as an actor. I said, I'm not an actor, I'm a producer. I completely transformed myself into being a respectable human being. And I said, I don't think so. Sidney Newman, who said, uh, we call it the Avengers. I don't know what it means, but it's a hell of a good title. And the brief was that they had a, a young doctor who'd been played in a series called Police Surgeon by Ian Hendry. Which was then developed into the first series of the Avengers, starring Ian Hendry and Patrick McNee. Doctor? Yeah? We take him to your surgery. What for? It's quieter there. Yeah, well, I'd like to keep it that way. That's precisely my point. He's a private patient. That's why I brought you along. Did the police surgeon and I don't follow me? The writers were very considerable writers anyway. Ian Henry treated them as hacks, which was a brilliant idea because it stirred them up. It made them furious. So everybody came in with their creative juices, very highly developed. And he would sit down. I once saw him take a script and tear the whole lot out and start writing it from page one. We only had 10 days rehearsal. But I do remember an occasion when Ian was finally hoist by his own petard because he was rewriting a scene and he said, now that there's, there's, there's one, there's something we really want here, there's one line missing. So he went straight back to the original, and there it was. You fractured a vertebra. You move that head, you're dead. What? A broken neck. You must have done it when you fell. Go on, Nicky. He's a good dick with a broken neck. Well, move it then. Go on, move it. It hurts. Help me! Exactly what I'm trying. Keep still. You want to drop dead? Better. We finally said, I think we deserve an extra five pounds a week. <laughs> they said, what do you mean? And so there was a strike, and we went on strike for five months. Well, Ian, who by this time had gained tremendous sort of respect, but became a movie star. And God bless him, he went off and left, and quite naturally. I, for some obscure reason, sort of held on. So at the end of this five months, they said, right, you're back. We've just fired John Paul from probation officer. If you think you're getting any more money, in spite of the fact that you've won this strike against us, you're not. We'll get a younger and better man. You're getting five pound a week extra. They didn't really want to spend money changing the scripts or getting new scripts, but they wanted a girl. So they brought in uh, on a black man as Kathy Gale, and she more or less played a man's part, you see. It was Sidney Newman's idea that there should be a woman. We're supposed to have a, a walleye or a withered arm or something strange. And they got on a blackman who was a beautiful blonde with a bosom to take your breath away and the hips of a boy scout and long runners Jesse Owens legs. And they didn't alter the scripts at all which were written for a man and she just thought I'll play it as though I'm really stronger than a man which indeed she was. Patrick had a lot to do with this you know because Patrick would say right at the beginning, we all knew what kind of character we were going after, and he would say, oh, she'd never say that. She'd put her foot down, she'd do this, that, and the other. So what with him and me saying I wouldn't say that, and this is the kind of thing she would do, and the director, and Leonard White, the producer, uh, we all pitched in. It really was a very much a team effort. Couldn't I write my own cliches? I've got some very powerful stuff just further on here. That on. truck would have had time to get 40 or 50 miles, wouldn't it, before the fog lifted? You see, my rhetoric is wasted on you. I'm still trying to work out where you could hide a five megaton warhead. Almost anywhere, preferably a built-up area. Well, the biggest built-up area within a 50-mile radius of where that truck was ambushed is London. Yeah, I suppose that would be about the biggest. Things like the black leather, I think that was because Pat liked it. I remember the conversation vividly between the producer and Patrick. And I was walking, I think I was learning my lines or something, and I was walking up and down, not paying much attention. 
And um, they were saying, we've got to have a, a tough material for her to wear. And Patrick said, what, what about suede, you know? And Leonard said, well, no, that's not good because it absorbs light. But what about the other side? What about leather? It is a cheap fit comes ski school in Victoria. Personally, I'm surprised a man like St. John bothers with it. Leather is a well-known sexual fetish. And when you put leather on the female form, it can have a remarkable erotic effect. A nuclear warhead has been lost. What do you mean, lost? I think it was the first time that, that somebody like Honor had been seen in, in kinky leather equipment and with people like Don Lever and Peter always shooting it so that her bum was in the air, it started to achieve a sort of kinky quality. It was very difficult, you know, for the writers because they had never written for this kind of woman before. And so they really, they really had to jolt their, um, uh, their prejudices a lot. The most difficult thing, of course, was to write the right stories. I interviewed 80 writers. I think I commissioned 30, and we ended up employing about five or six. Richard uh, was a very considerable part of its success in that he got writers who wanted to, um, to write of a certain sort of quality script. And up till that time, I think writers on The Avengers have been a bit of a joke, and Richard made it all legitimate. I have to say, it was hugely hard work. I mean, I have never worked so many hours in a week as I did in those days. Fortunately, I was uh, pretty young, and we were an extraordinarily young team. I mean, everybody was in their uh, mid to late 20s. I mean, even the most experienced of the directors we were using, I think, were only sort of 30 and maybe early 30s. The directors gave the show a very visual input, and that stayed with the Avengers throughout its life. Quite right. The set was wonderful. It was about a, 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 someone who was blind, and they could only get about by feeling their way around. The path was on the ceiling, and instead of using his feet, he, he used his hands. I played the villain. I played the villain in all of them. I mean, not in every episode of The Avengers, you understand, but in the four that I did. I'm thrilled to hear you say it. In that case, we'll just leave it as it is, shall we? Meanwhile, we'll be getting along with Steed and Mrs Gale, of course. We couldn't afford to build too many sets, big sets. So they brought in a, a, a very talented director called Peter Hammond. And he, for instance, if, he, if we were shooting in a bank, he would just have a grill and some money and shoot through it, and that was a bank. I can remember the guy in the sound booth putting the stylus down on the OP record, you know. It seems to me it's so archaic. It's like steam, isn't it? You know, they sort of five, four, three, two, one, and down it would go boom, 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 boom. You know, and you think, what? You know, and then you would fade it down and cue the actor. The pressure then that one underwent when one was uh, videoing it was tremendous. And we only stopped once for one uh, commercial break during the whole thing. So I was running between scenes, changing my clothes, fighting, perspiring, or glowing, or whatever it is women are supposed to do. <laughs> You're never supposed to sweat, but boy, do you? And then, then put on new clothes, and then lie on the chaise long and look terribly cool and wonderful in the next scene, which is jolly difficult to do. Let's not push our luck, Steen. We only just got through this one. <laughs> She was the first really emancipated feminist and I'm quite proud that we did it first. Um, she played it with the toughness of a man but was undeniably a very sexy and desirable woman. Can you imagine now when they run all the banks, when they run all the film companies, when they run almost anything, God bless them, I've worked for more women than you and I have had hot dinners. But at that time, the fact that somebody could be looked on an equal level with a man was something new. <laughs> I have to say that once I started fighting, it really put some, some iron in my soul because having been the first woman who ever fought and having to do it on the studio floor, on the cement, it was really tough going. And when they used to, they used to play the music during the show, uh, when the fights were coming up, you know, my stomach used to start rolling when I heard the music because I had to do it right, being the only woman who'd ever done it. I, I wasn't going to make a mistake. I mean, I practically half killed some people. The famous occasion, of course, was when we got Jackie Palo into Mandrake 
and Arna Blackman knocked him out and knocked him out with such effect that he was on the front page of every newspaper the next day. And I went Peesh, like that and I saw his nose split, I saw his eyes go and he still remembered the next move, which was great. He ran round the grave, we fought for the shovel, I gave him a push, he dropped into the grave and he was unconscious for seven and a half minutes. <gasps> oh! And this gorgeous woman was what started the whole Avengers off. That's what made it so special, so different. And we never fraternised, we never sexualised. If we actually did get together, what would be the point? Then there were millions of relationships like that. Of course, there is no sex as such in it. I mean, it's implied, certainly. The audience always wondered what really was the relationship between uh, Cathy Gann and Steed. And I think every week turned on in the hope that they would see these two at least kiss. But of course, it never happened. I always thought that they were like Hope and Crosby that um, the, the woman played Hope and Crosby was always, who was Steed, was always getting them to wrestle the alligator. Goodbye, Steve. Hey. That's what I said. Goodbye. But that isn't asking too much. Oh, yes, it is. You see, I'm not going to be pussyfooting along those sun-soaked shores. I'm going to be lying on them. Not pussyfooting. I must have been misinformed. I completely understood anyone who was offered a large part in a Bond film would hardly want to go on doing just television, but I missed her desperately, the show missed her, and she was a very unique person, and still is. There were cries of traitor because it was so successful, they couldn't believe I was leaving it. But I think it was the right decision. I'm sorry in lots of ways, because it would have been fun. I knew it was going on to film, I knew it was going into colour. But two years is long enough. I think, uh, I mean, the, as I say, the scripts had started leaving the ground a bit. It certainly changed the show from the director's point of view, because the directors had established the house style of the Avengers. Peter Hammond, Don Lever, Kim Mills, Bill Bain didn't follow it through to Elstree onto film. And I think that was something that the show lost out on. Everybody wanted to go, go over onto film. Perhaps if we'd realised what it would do to the series now, we wouldn't have been so keen. I think the television people, in a way, kind of resented the film people, but at the same time, it was a whole new ball game. It was done at the ABC studios in a film studio, and it was shot exactly, or nearly exactly, like a film. The Avengers, although it was very well known in this country, was totally unknown internationally. So in uh, America and uh, Europe, it was a, like a brand new show to them with Diana Rick. Extraordinary crimes against the people and the state have to be avenged by agents extraordinary. Two such people are John Steed, top professional, and his partner, Emma Peel, talented amateur. Otherwise known as the Avengers. She was kind of unique in that she was a woman that the, the women wanted to watch and identified with and were fascinated to see what clothing she was wearing, what she was going to do this week, and all the men wanted to take to bed, and that's not a bad combination, really. A to D? E to K. Ah. Philanthropic Union for Rescue, Relief and Recuperation of Cats. A feline paradise run by a man called Cheshire. So that's why, Mr. Purr. You read on, that'll make you bristle, you beautiful bronze tabby. <laughs> I always said, I don't know what's gone on before, but I personally think that they've had an affair, a wild affair, and it's over now, so they can feel happy and contented with each other uh, without ever going to bed again and go to bed with a lot of other people. Quite often, it is the distance between two people which is the most interesting thing. It's never the clinch. It's always the dialogue before the clinch or the silence before the clinch. Or perhaps they're just going through an awkward phase. Awkward phase or not, I don't approve of it. I went to Paris and saw the Courage fashion show where the miniskirt was invented, really. Keep talking. We were, had to decide whether we were going to put Diana Rigg in a miniskirt, and which, in episodes which would not be seen for several months, by which time the miniskirt might have failed. It was a long, hard decision, but we took it, and, of course, it, it paid off. Subliminally, it was, it was quite kinky. I think um, I always seem to be strapped to a dentist's chair with my feet in the air, and, and the camera seemed to linger an awful lot of my, my high-heeled boots. Excellent. Not from where I'm sitting. 
But the attitude I brought towards this show was, I will not carry a gun at all. And I never, ever carried a gun unless I happened to pick one up that somebody had dropped. You must remember what was happening in real life. I mean, the CIA were trying to poison Castro's boot polish. We had to compete with that kind of bizarre thing. We had to go one step better than boot polish. When we went to Elstree, it became much more of uh, Brian Clemens's show. And after a time, I found that I was enjoying it less. Uh, not that I fell out with Brian in particular, but I was having to do things that he wanted to do, writing the scripts that he wanted to write, as opposed to what I wanted to write, and that seemed a time to stop. The Avengers created its own show, almost like a pantomime, really. And that if you put Steed and Emma in a bus queue with ordinary people, they would look quite ridiculous. My friend, this is real! <laughs> Now, we, we weren't deliberately trying to keep black people from working, but The Avengers has always been a show that has no social awareness. We never dealt with drugs. We never dealt with homeless people. As I say, it was a never-never world. It's, it's the England of, you know, is there honey still for tea that people imagine existed, even if it didn't, you know. What do you think of my little setup? <laughs> a highly trained force. And they get better every day. Trained, as you so aptly put it, to steal secrets, sell to the highest bidder. Ingenious. Ah, but this is only the beginning. Soon I will have a trained force in every capital city of the world. And then a third world power will emerge. We will grow in strength. We will grind our enemies under our heel until there is one world power, the state of Natskyville. I didn't have to do anything. I just responded to a lot of so-called mad or at least eccentric people, which I think is what, what made it. And also, if you're coping with somebody who's decided that the world has got to be wiped out or it's all got to go dry or flooded, the man has to have a touch of madness, so he has lots of acolytes, friends and crazies around with him. Midnight approaches. The witching hour! Peter Wingard was dressed as a Regency buck, a rake, and he was chasing Diana Rigg in, in, in a cellar. Diana Rigg in a very, very sexy costume, which is the sort that you see, you know, Miss Whiplash wearing. I do remember having to wear this snake on my arm for an entire day. And the snake handler was terribly sweet. He said, you know, he could pee any minute now. And I thought, oh, please, no. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> He starts to whip her. Now, what do you like with the big boys? I think he whipped her four times or five times, and we had to cut it down to one whipping, just one, one lash of the whip. That was here. In America, they banned it altogether. But the interesting thing is that although ABC Network banned it, their executives used to play it at every convention because <laughs> they liked it. In the uh, evening news, the whole of a paper the whole of one page had a still of Dinah Rigg holding the whip in her hand, and it said, what you won't see on television tonight. <laughs> when a character is removed from a long-running series, they always do what I hate, they kill them off, which means that all the fans hate that particular episode. And in Forget Me Not, I actually wrote it so that Steed both lost and got the girl. Always. Keep your bowler on in times of stress. And watch out for diabolical masterminds. I'll remember. Goodbye, Steve. Emma. Thanks. The day that I took over from her, that was the episode Forget Me Not. And um, I was terribly nervous about meeting her on the stairs, and she just says, He likes his tea stirred. Anti-clockwise. And my heart was thumping. I was sure that they could hear it, you know, my heart was beating so hard. And Diana had, she had tears in her eyes, because it was really, that was her last day. There was a changeover when, when Di left to do other things, and Linda Thorson came onto it. And at that time, I think some television people came over, and it was a disaster. I don't think the, the episodes have ever been shown. I saw one, and it was terrible. If you ask me, would I have cast her? I wouldn't have cast her, and I wouldn't have cast somebody as young as her. 
Nevertheless, I did, I got the part, but by the time I got the part, they put me in a health farm because they thought I was too fat and that I looked too much like Diana. So they bleached my hair blonde and put me in a health farm and I still didn't know I had the part. And I'd been on hot water and lemon for about eight days. And John Bryce, the producer, came out to tell me that I had the part and I fainted. It wasn't really Linda's, uh, Linda Thorson's fault. I mean, she was pulled straight out of drama school without experience. She was Canadian, of Canadian background. And she uh, lacked the kind of acid Chelsea sort of sense of humour that the other two girls had had. And um, she was also slightly overweight. And uh, for some reason, they'd put her in a blonde, bubbly wig, which made her look a bit like Harpo Marx. I did a lot of my own stunts. I, um, I, Sid Childs was my stunt double, and um, she was absolutely brilliant, but her bum was bigger than mine, so I always used to get furious when they'd use her for shots while she was walking away. Linda wasn't very happy about it. Linda felt that she should sort of fulfil the publicity of doing her own stunts, and uh, she wanted to do it all herself. And uh, it took quite a while before she got used to the idea, and I don't think she ever really liked it very much. <laughs> There'd been a whole meeting about the fact that when I jumped over the couch in Steed's flat, which was that leather, beautiful leather couch, that my knickers showed, and I was in a tiny little skirt. And we were sitting there, and I was getting more and more embarrassed. And I suddenly thought, why am I sitting in this room with all these men? I mean, change the stunt. Do something else. Give me a longer skirt. And Patrick said, don't you ever go to one of those meetings without me there again. You're never to go without me. So, I mean, he really championed me and helped me through it. Uh, I think up front, it, it gave Pat more confidence, and perhaps a more mentor's role. He was helping her a great deal. And so that changed subtly the relationship. Also, because she was younger, I think that um, I had to take away the fact that they, in my mind, that they'd gone to bed together. Because, you know, she was too young, made Pat look like a dirty old man. Cara, my Aunt Emily's battered, brassy, ancient alarm clock with one hand missing tells me that dawn approaches. Oh. So it's time we kept our appointment with the oh. here. And I always played Tara um, as if she were madly in love with Steed. Um, I mean, I got eventually the right to have my own input into the character. I would say, pound for pound, there were, there were more good, superb scripts in the Linda Thorson series than there were in the other, in the Die Rig ones. Mm -hmm. Because by that time, we'd found our way. We were all very confident and we were exploring new avenues, really. And then I think in the Diana Rigg areas, I think it was... The, the actors got it right, if I may say that. And then I think in the Thorson area, we somehow... The, the act, and somehow the visuals caught up and, and supplement... And the whole thing seemed to work in a kind of wonderful madness. Ah. <laughs> talking about the tyranny of common sense. And I think the, the, the Avengers is a wonderful example of, of, of avoiding the tyranny of common sense. Can you get us down? Eventually, yes. Yes, I think I can. Eventually? There's no hurry. Is there? None at all. They'll be back. You can depend on it. I was going back to do what they called the New Avengers, and for some obscure reason we were doing it in Toronto, and I got into the elevator, and there was the great actor, Peter O'Toole himself. He said, what are you doing here, Patrick? I said, well, I'm, 
I'm doing the Avengers. He said, Patrick, you're always doing the Avengers. And I know exactly what he meant. I suppose if you take the broader view, I might have uh, gone on to bigger and better things. I know I turned down some very fine plays and other things just to stay with it, but I wanted to stay with it to the end, which indeed I did. I started in 1960 and finished in 1969. The thing about Patrick was he used sometimes to wing it like mad come the show. I mean, something that, uh, some pieces of dialogue that he wasn't either sure of or entirely happy with, he'd suddenly wing it. But he'd always come back to the queue. He'd never drop you in it. I never knew how he managed it. Well, my hair used to stand on end because I'm a, I'm a rock shore kind of performer. I like to know what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. I like to be well rehearsed. But Patrick was a great winger. And sometimes when he winged it, he, he was better than the original script, so. And it kept us on our toes. <laughs> he used to worry about me like mad because, um, where the fighting was concerned, you know how Patrick used to fight with umbrellas and this, that and the other. Never tough fisticuffs or anything like that. He's not that sort of character. And he used to say, oh, darling, you shouldn't do that. Why don't you? Don't. Why don't you fight like me with a this, with an umbrella or something? I said, we can't have two of us, Patrick. One of us has got to be a toughie. I was just a sort of presence, the way, sort of highfalutin way people have of describing something. So I had to kind of rationalize and make it work and it seemed to me if he was a shadowy person who was helping people rescue other people he was something like the Scarlet Pimpernel and I went back to the Baroness Auxey books and I'm an 18th century man anyway and I have a great feeling for that period of time in which you gave the impression of being the fop of being somebody extremely well dressed who really nobody would feel was a threat and underneath you were rescuing people from the tumbrel like the way that Leslie Howard played it. The bowler hat is something that somebody goes to business uh, in the city in. But I remember we used to wear bowler hats with a thing in the head uh, 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 riding. I was brought up in a rather privileged way in the sense that one had a pony and one went, uh, awful to think of it now, hunting foxes. But anyway, during this period of time, you would wear a bowler hat. I, for, I don't know for what reason. They used to put a flat iron on the side and curl it up. And in the top, they put a thing in case you fell off and broke your head. And it was that simple, because I came from that background. My dad was used to lean over the garden gate. He had a beautiful cravat, the pearl pin, and beautifully cut sort of clothes. And he was a dandy. So was the Scarlet Pimpernel. So was my commanding officer in the Navy. His name was Bussy Carr. He came with the Carr's Biscuit family. And he would stand on the bridge with his white thing and his DSC and his cap and all that. And I used to think he was the most romantic creature going. So I think I combined those sort of romantic images to bring to this character. After all, it was only fantasy. When I went under contract to rank, I played, uh, I played lots of very good parts, but I was accepted as sort of, a sort of English rose, you know? I was never accepted as a sort of toughie. So it was a complete vault fast for me, and it was so wonderful because, I mean, it's so boring being an English rose and being the lovely one and the one that stands by the kitchen sink waiting for the fella to come home. And to be somebody who... I don't know how to put it politely, but it has some punch. Uh, it was really great, really great. I, I, it, was, it was a sort of liberation. It was the first women's lib part, I suppose. Certainly the worst, first woman who, who was an intellectual equal to the man. And, I mean, by far and away, the very first woman who ever defended herself physically. And um, so it, it was wonderful to play it. I only know that the, the, the producer used to find me a bigger and better man every week. I mean, I finished up with, oh, I don't know, somebody who was 18 stone or something like that. It was ridiculous. And you try and give somebody like that a stomach throw. Do you know what a stomach throw is? You know, when you take them by the lapels, you put your foot in their chest, you drop to your bottom and then you roll over, then you kick. You don't kick too early, otherwise he lands on your face. <laughs> you have to be jolly strong anyway. And I mean, I used to drop right on the bottom of my spine instead of my bottom, because I haven't got much bottom anyway. But I used to be so overexcited doing it, you know. And so uh, uh, they would uh, arrange this so that it was this very, very heavy, great big man, because it was such fun to see me give him a, a, a stomach throw. I remember I had to have a medical 
in the middle of the second year or something and the doctor was listening to my chest and then he said okay let's let's listen to your back and and I turned my back to him and he went <gasps> and I said what is it what is it he said your back I said what's happened to it and he said the skin's all off your spine oh I said oh yes that's always like that it's stomach throws <laughs> Believe it, you know, but the skin was always coming off my back when the stomach grew. She was quite a chaste person, actually, Kathy Gale. I mean, I know she was a very sort of sexy image, but she never wore sort of low cut dresses and all that sort of thing. She was always up to here and down to there. It was a very fascinating character. I mean, there, uh, other people, I think, decided more about what kind of clothes she might wear. I mean, until I got into the fitting room and then one knew what one was doing with oneself with that particular garment. But I really cared about what went on inside her more than, than the, the, the outer image. Everybody else cared about the outer image. I mean, I was invited to all sorts of parties and would I bring my whip? Very strange it was. I was surprised that I actually got the part, but I had been working so much towards it, and we had done also a, a nine-minute movie that we'd taken all day to do by going around London, and I had to show that I was very athletic. And being a Canadian, I think that helped me as well, because I could do lots of things that maybe, you know, English girls weren't used to doing, having been brought up in a country where you so, do so many different sports and things. So I remember, I mean, one morning we went on Hampstead Heath and I rode a motorbike, and then I had to climb trees, and then I had to swim in the, the pond on Hampstead Heath, and it was bloody freezing. And then I had to ride, ride a white stallion down Rotten Row in the afternoon, and then we went somewhere else, and then I changed and went to a discotheque and danced, and they did this thing and I knew that in fact at the end of the day they were all quite impressed I was half dead and um, they they sent this off to um, I guess it was ABC in America because all the money from the Avengers at that time came from well, I guess it always did come from um, from America so they said that and I think I I knew that I'd sort of done my my best at that point but I, I had no experience and I think what they finally decided is that they did want to go with someone much younger and I think Patrick was he wasn't keen on that idea. Um, I think he thought that I should have been, I mean, there's 10 years between Diana and myself, and I think he thought I was really much too young. So um, I had to sort of chat, chat him round eventually, and then, and then I think eventually he thought that we did look right together. It was very, very, very difficult to follow Diana, mainly because I filmed altogether um, 33 episodes, but we had 12 or 13 of those episodes in the can before they were actually on television. So I had this dreadful reputation of being sort of someone who thought she was Greta Garbo. I didn't want to talk to the press. I was very nervous because I simply thought the rating, they were, if they don't like me and the ratings die and I've already done all this pre-publicity, I'm going to look right now. No. So I, I, I was nervous about how, you know, how the public would accept me. And she was very, very much loved. It's not that I didn't have confidence in what I was doing and that I thought it was different and, and was going to work. I, I mean, I really believed it was going to work. I really loved working with Patrick. It was lots of fun. And, and it is like a marriage without sex. I mean, doing a television series with someone who's your partner, scene after scene, and sometimes, in the end, we were very, very backed up with air dates and we were shooting six days a week and all hours of the day, you know, coming in at 5.30 in the morning and being in a decent mood and getting made up and being there till late. And I, 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 just, I just think the man is... I mean, he's a, re he's a real gentleman. Patrick is a real gen really gentle man and he really cares about about women and, and looking after us. And I mean, he could get absolutely furious, but he'd always sort of take my hand and I'd be part of him being furious. So we'd be furious together. So, you know, although sometimes it was quite, you know, the earth would quake, but uh, you knew that he was, you know, he'd always give you a little wink and say, that's, you know, it's not, not mad at you. Do you think you'll be the last John Steed ever? <laughs> I haven't the faintest idea and I don't know who cares, but I would think so. Now, I've certainly been the only one for what it's worth.